Hey, welcome to the ground instruction for exercise 23 navigation, this time focusing on the diversion exercise. You can begin by thinking of diversions as an in the moment decision. You should always be aware of your closest airports and know what you would do in the event of a diversion. And a diversion could arise due to many things such as an ill passenger, deteriorating weather or insufficient fuel to make destination. Now we actually make diversions all the time. Sometimes the weather for training isn't what we expect it might be. And the decision that we make is simply to divert back to the home airport. Nevertheless, the mental process should be the same. In its simplest form, a diversion is the following. Where am I going? How will I get there? And do I have enough fuel? If you can answer these three questions, then you essentially have your diversion. In order to get the answer to these questions, pilots sometimes use the following rhyme to remind themselves of the steps in a diversion. You can also use the five T's. You don't have to use either, but I'm gonna use both in this ground lesson. But the intent of practicing diversions is to make sure that you can answer the previous three questions and plan to fly a diversion. Let's talk about the key differences between navigation and diversion, and the key difference is the tools that you use. In a diversion, you are not permitted to use a flight computer or a ruler. So where the navigation exercise is about precision, the diversion is more about estimation. Now, before we go any further, I just want to stress that if you hear the word divert or diversion, get into the habit of setting your heading indicator to your magnetic compass. It's very likely that as you've been flying, your heading indicator has precessed and could be off by as much as 15 degrees. And if you don't do this before you start all of your calculations and everything else for the exercise, your entire diversion is going to be a mess. So picture this, let's say you're at the Red Cross and your original plan was to go to Langley Airport on that green line, but now you need to divert to Chilliwack. So on your map, you're first going to identify your position, then draw two circles and a line. The first circle is your destination and the second circle is your track interception point. Then draw a line between the two. This might be a good time to note if there's an altitude restriction anywhere along this line. Since in our case there is not, we can assume that we can intercept this track at any altitude that would suit our needs. Also, try to keep your intercept point not too close as you want to be able to do the calculations for this diversion before you're required to turn onto that track. And we'll see why that is in a few slides. Next, we want to obtain the heading and distance and time. So what you can do for this is you can grab a pencil and you can line it up with your intended track. Then carefully line up your pencil with a compass rose. The compass rose shows radials in magnetic, so no conversion from true to magnetic is required. Just simply read the heading off of the compass rose. Figuring out the distance is actually quite simple, even though you're not allowed to use a navigational rule or even a notched pencil, notched just meaning that you've already drawn nautical miles onto the pencil to make it a ruler. But basically, if you just take your pen or a pencil, uh, line it up and gather the distance of your intended track, and then adjust your pen or pencil along the minutes of latitude, which can be found on the VTA. So all of these little notches that you see here, they are all representative of one nautical mile or one minute of latitude. So in lining up your pencil, you can actually use it as a chart rule and determine the distance that you have to travel to your destination. So time gets a little bit tricky here because you have to assume that you're gonna know what your ground speed is. And of course your ground speed is gonna depend on what your airspeed is, as well as the wind direction and strength. Um, also in a diversion due to weather, for example, if the scenario is reduced visibility, you might even choose to fly at a slower airspeed in order to keep yourself out of trouble. So all of these things should be taken into consideration. In the type of aircraft that I fly, a ground speed of about 90 knots is not really unusual if I'm flying at about a normal cruising speed. So what I tell my students to do is, you, what you can do is you can take 90 knots as an assumed ground speed, and of course you're gonna do an updated ETA before or about at the time that you're a third through the distance of your diversion that's part of your uh, flight test requirements. So now that you know what your distance is to the destination because you've already figured this out prior, 
what you're going to do is, if you want, you can take 90 knots as an assumed ground speed, and realistically, depending on how fast you're going, and, uh, and then it makes the calculation easy because it's literally the distance times two divided by three. Um, this can be a little bit of a complicated exercise if you're not good at doing mental math. So if this is challenging for you, I recommend doing these kinds of calculations on the ground before you even get in the plane to practice the diversion in order to make it easier for you. Now that we know how long it will take us to get to our destination, we might want to think about fuel. In this situation, we might not be concerned about it as our original destination and our new destination are roughly the same distance away. If we wanted to be more precise, however, we can assume about six gallons per hour is the burn rate, which means one gallon of fuel for each 10 minutes. And we already determined that eight minutes was all that we needed. So we really only need one gallon for this trip. And then we'll wanna have 30 minutes of reserve fuel as per the Canadian Aviation Regulations. So now we have our diversion mapped out. We have a set heading point, a track, a distance, an ETA, and a fuel requirement. So what else do we need? And this is where you can use the five T's to help you remember. Once you turn onto your track, you'll take the time, set the throttle for a 90 knot ground speed, and then tune and talk. In your flight test, you'll want to uh, simulate that you've notified ATC or ATS about your diversion, especially if you've filed a flight plan. So once you've turned onto your track, tune up the correct frequency and make a call with your expected ETA. The last thing that you'll want to do is take a ground speed check to make sure that your calculations were correct. As you can see, I've divided the line here into three sections. The reasoning is the following. I can fly one third of the route, time how long it takes, and then double that and that will give me my revised ETA. Depending on how long the segment is, you can split your track up into more sections. For example, if I wanted to divert all the way to Hope, I would maybe split the line into six sections, time the first, and then multiply it by five to get my updated ETA. Remember that this ground speed check is also an approximation as opposed to a calculation, which is done in the navigation exercise. There are still a few things we haven't discussed yet and we've covered a lot. Diversions are a relatively quick and easy exercise, yet there are still many variables to consider. First is to take into consideration your track to destination. Are there any airspace restrictions on the way? You may need to request permission from ATC to pass through their airspace en route. Is there any limiting geography, such as mountains or large bodies of water in the way? Anything requiring you to gain altitude might impact your fuel as you'll have a slightly higher burn rate in the climb. Or you might run into weather, on that note, a diversion path that could work fine on a good day might be restricted on a bad weather day, forcing you to choose a different track to destination and perhaps changing the fuel requirement. Another thing that will help in diversions, especially if you are heading towards unfamiliar area, is are there any geographical features that you can follow to reach destination? Highways, shorelines, and rivers are all very good visible landmarks that assist in dead reckoning navigation when you're flying without a well-planned navigation log. A few other points is make sure that you review your flight test standards uh, for this exercise on your flight test. I know from the PPL exercise, it is that you're, you will be judged on your ability to maintain heading for plus or minus 10 degrees, airspeed for plus or 10 knots, and altitude within 200 feet. Also, as I mentioned before, you're going to need to simulate commuting to ATS or ETC, so make sure that you know who you're going to call, how to look up that number, and what you're going to tell them. Give an ETA and revised ETA to your examiner and assert whether you have enough fuel to make destination in order to complete the exercise. So now that you know the steps to how to do a diversion exercise while in the plane, I highly advise that you do a few of these and I'll give you a couple of scenarios to try in the next few slides. Practice this on the ground. You'll find that in the airplane you are so task saturated that it's going to draw out the exercise and probably waste a significant amount of your airtime, which we all know is expensive. So plan out, grab your chart, your paper chart, and actually do a couple of diversions on the ground. Or even if you want to do a ground brief, and uh, with your instructor just to walk through before you start burning $50 an hour in the aircraft trying to do it in the air. It's a lot easier to and a lot 
better practice to make sure that you have clarity on what it is that you're doing before you start practicing it once you're up in the air. Okay, so here's an example of a diversion that you might get on a flight test. So let's say you were doing your flight test and you're north of Chilliwack Airport and you've just been doing some exercises in the practice area there and your examiner says, well, okay, you are gonna go to Chilliwack, but you can see that the runway surface is contaminated. So divert me to Pitt Meadows. So at that point you'd say, okay, where am I? Where am I going? How am I gonna get there? Um, and then who do I call? Flight services, what's their frequency? What do I tell them? And then you start en route and before you finish, before the examiner will call off the exercise, he's gonna want an updated ETA and he's gonna to wanna to know if you have enough fuel to make destination. And one of the reasons I like this diversion exercise is that uh, if you look on the map as well, you'll notice that there's this beautiful landmark, the river, which if you follow it more or less at a heading of roughly 250 or 260, uh, it will take you to your destination. And on the private pilot flight test, they do like to see you using landmarks, so roads, rivers, etc., in order to help you navigate, because that way they know that if you ever find yourself in a situation of low visibility, you will be able to use a map to help guide you to an airport. Um, in the commercial, you're gonna wanna use um, a specific method of more of a dead reckoning approach um, in your diversion. You're not, they're not gonna wanna see you relying on landmarks as much. They're gonna wanna see you calculating your diversion. One last example that you might get on a flight test. So you've just departed Chilliwack Airport. You're on your way back to your home airport, Langley. You tune up the ATIS and you hear that both uh, Langley and Pitt airspaces are closed. So now you decide to divert to Abbotsford. That's your scenario. Where are you? What is in the way? There's a mountain in the way probably if you're coming from Chilliwack. So are you gonna go over it? Are you gonna go around it? Who are you going to uh, tune up and call? And lastly, do you have enough fuel? If you are comfortable doing all of these exercises on the ground in a relatively short amount of time, only then would I advise to get in the plane and actually start to practice these so that you're comfortable doing it on your flight test.